Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Jobs and Business Development Committee meeting for Wednesday, May 9th, 2012. It is 8.40. My apologies for starting a couple minutes uh, behind here. We have two items today that we're going to take in reverse order because Mr. Uh, uh, LaBange is expected to join us and wanted us to hold item one until he is here. So we'll go to item two. We have uh, uh, basically until uh, 9.05 to do that. So we get, that gives us about 25 minutes and should give us 55 minutes to uh, look at the uh, business tax reform motion. So with that, if we can take up, uh, do we have any general public comment first? None? Okay. We'll close our general public comment and if we can take up item two, please. Item number two is a resolution Alarcon Garcetti Labanche relative to the support or sponsorship of legislation that would extend and expand state tax credits for filming and expand these credits to attract and retain a broader range of productions, including commercial productions. This item was waived by the rules elections at Intergovernmental Relations Committee. All right, I see we have John Hollywood Wickham up there. <laughs> How are you doing this morning? Doing all right, thank you. Good. John Wickham with the CLA's office. All right. Uh, we have a report on file recommending support of a uh, resolution to support AB 2026 and any legislative or administrative actions that would extend the existing film tax credit program through the year 2019-2020, and then to also seek amendments to um, expand the amount of the tax credit available and, and expand the definition of productions and, and other such um, amendments to ensure that more productions are available um, to receive this tax credit program. We've got a lot of data in the report um, concerning the effectiveness of the tax credit that's already been adopted. And it's pretty clear that the, this tax credit has stemmed the tide of a runaway production. It's really made a difference. It hasn't significantly increased the amount of production occurring in California, but in, in Los Angeles at least, it's it stopped the, the losses. And the losses have been pretty extreme. Um, back in the mid-1990s, we were at about 13,000 production days for film in the city, and we're down to about 5,000 now. So it's almost uh, two-thirds loss in that area. Um, the way the there are a lot of technical elements to the, the tax credit program, but in effect, it's a but-for program. But for this tax credit, these productions would not be in California, and they would not be paying any taxes in California. By having this tax credit in place, they're paying 80, 75 or 80 percent of the taxes that they would be required to pay, and they're getting a break on the remaining 20 or 25 percent. So from the get-go, keeping them here is a net plus to the, to the state, and it's also a net plus to the city because they're paying sales taxes, they're paying whatever other taxes they would be required to pay in the city, in the county, in the state. And then one of the benefits that occurs here by having these productions in the state is that they're hiring people to work, and those people are earning a salary, and they will be paying a, a, a personal income tax down the line and they will be doing all the other economic benefits that help the economy in the long run. So the state actually gets to the point where they make up that difference that they gave in the credit. So there are a lot of good things happening with this tax credit in the state. It's not just a giveaway. Um, so the, the, the resolution that the uh, CLA has attached to the report, we, we identified um, AB 2026, which came in afterward as a bill that is carrying this legislation. There's also a Calderon bill and I don't ha in the Senate, and I don't have that bill number in front of me. It's 1167, if I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah 1167. So um, those are the two vehicles right now that are moving an extension only. And so the resolution is, is drafted in a way to support the extension and then to seek amendments. And that would be to, to find other types of to allow larger film productions to be eligible, to allow a broader range of television productions to be eligible. Um, and it's important to um, comment on commercial productions at this point. Commercials are structured. <clears throat> Back in 930, so? yeah. 
the 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 business model for commercial productions is very different from television and film productions and it's important to try and retain those productions in California as well but we think it's very important that 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 another bill another vehicle be identified to provide um, tax credits to commercial productions the structures of that tax credit is going to be very different we don't want to um, we don't think it would be helpful to confuse the two. I think it would confuse the legislative process and, by inserting an entirely different tax credit system into the current bills and that it would be more productive to find another vehicle, have a clear, clean argument for each of them independently and move those forward in that way. Okay. And then the other is that, you know, at $100, $100 million a year, it's just not enough there needs to be more um, that's available to keep more productions in, um, in the state. And so those are, those are some of the key things that we think ought to be um, pursued. Okay. Um, I agree uh, on a number of fronts, probably all the fronts. One, I, I personally believe, um, this is not the city position right now, I personally believe that $100 million is way too uh, short. I agree with the Headway Project that at least $200 million, if not, uh, lifting the cap altogether would be in the fiscal and financial interests of the state. I do believe we could expand also to look at premium cable, as I've mentioned, big budget movies, commercial production as well. But in my conversations with Sacramento uh, and the folks that are pursuing this, there is a very delicate coalition. They have choppy waters ahead of them, uh, not sure in both the Senate and potentially even with the governor's office uh, whether there is a guarantee of success in just renewing what we have. So we have on the table is a five-year, which would be better than one-year renewal, so $500 million, but still at the $100 million mark, that I think it would be appropriate since those are before us to take positions on while developing a parallel track of saying the city of Los Angeles on the record would like to see, you know, in the future in the state um, tax credits design that would include and move into those areas because I think the case has been made uh, quite well that um, movies over 75 million, that commercial uh, production and that premium cable and even broadcast has been brought up um, to us as well um, by uh, some of the studios who have talked to us about this. We all would love to see um, the state, I think, be more aggressive. We'd love to see um, them uh, have the courage to move forward um, more broadly, but this is not just a coalition of folks in the entertainment industry. We know that there are unions up and down the state, there are uh, the Chamber of Commerce, there's other folks who have been part of a very craft, uh, carefully crafted coalition um, that we don't want to seek to disrupt. Um, let's continue to keep that foot in the door before it slams shut and then see if we can pry it open more. So my recommendation the committee would be to move forward in supporting uh, the, the Assembly and Senate bills that are before us and then to be able to have a parallel track, uh, Mr. Alicorn and I, um, and I know we have a representative of Mr. Alicorn's office here um, to read a, a letter into the record. We welcome uh, her and uh, Mr. Alicorn's leadership on this as well um, to look at what we can do to in the short term. And I don't mean putting this off for a year. Uh, we'll have this back in committee and like to ask the CLA to help us develop what that more robust recommendation long term would be uh, without assigning it to, uh, to this year's bill and, and messing up that process. So that would be my... Uh, my motion, my suggestion, but um, Ms. Doughton, would you like to read in the record your letter? Good morning, uh, Committee Chairman and Councilmember Parks. I have a letter here on behalf of Councilmember Richard Alarcone, who is the co-author of the resolution that um, you, Councilmember Garcetti, co-authored as well in support of um, the expansion and the extension of the tax credits. So I'm just going to read the letter. Um, <clears throat> Dear Councilmember Garcetti, I'm writing today in strong support of the resolution that we co-introduced regarding the extension and expansion of the state film tax credits, including the support for expanding the tax credits to include a broader range of productions, including commercials. As you know, over the last several years, the City of Los Angeles has voted to implement more than two dozen actions to promote, protect, and increase film, TV, commercial, and music video production in Los Angeles. These actions include reducing the entertainment production cap, streamlining the permitting process, and waiving location fees for most city-owned buildings. The city council and mayor have actively worked to make it easier to film in L.A. because we know the positive local economic impact of the film industry. According to an L.A. Times article, 
The 2009 adjustment in the entertainment production cap contributed towards a record level of commercial production activity last, this past year. Additionally, it is clear that the California film tax incentive, incentives have allowed productions to remain in California, which otherwise would have shot elsewhere. That is why it is imperative that the City of Los Angeles goes on record in support of continuing these credits. At the same time, there are also opportunities to increase local economic impact by expanding the credits and including additional types of productions, such as commercials, as part of the incentive package. According to the Association of Independent Commercial Producers, AICP, commercials create over $5 billion of e dollars of economic impact every year, with just over 50% of all commercials shot domestic domestically located in Southern California. We know that the increased commercial activity will mean more jobs for residents of Los Angeles and greater tax income for the city. In addition, the inclusion of commercials as part of the state film tax incentive will also have a positive regional benefit, stimulating increased production activity throughout Los Angeles County, meaning, in turn, there will be increased use of Los Angeles-based businesses and hiring of Los Angeles workers for these Southern California productions. Los Angeles is an international entertainment hub, and there's no question that it is in the best interest of the city to support the extension of the state tax credit. At the same time, the expansion of these credits, excluding expanding the amount of the credits and the types of eligible productions, would increase the benefit to our city and allow for more Angelinos to be employed by the local film industry. That is why I urge you to join me in support of CFI number 12-0002-S27 to support the extension and expansion of the state tax credit program and support including commercials as part of the incentive. Yours truly, Richard Alarcone, Council Member, District 7. Thank you very much. Thank I appreciate you. that. Um, I'd like to give a further instruction to the CLA if we might. Um, I know that we've raised an issue, Councilmember Alicorn has also raised it in the past, about uh, whether or not we could have a city tax credit targeted at smaller productions, and specifically commercial productions, where a small amount of credit might actually make some sense. City attorneys raised some issues, I know, in the past, but maybe we could have a report back specifically on that. I don't want to lose that, that momentum of what we could do here locally while we also take the part of the motion uh, before us, the 12002 uh, S27, to uh, continue the work not just on the commercial production but also on the, uh, the blockbuster feature films and, um, and premium cable. Um, Absolutely. And, and I want to be very clear, well, I'm 100% I'm supportive of that, that was in the motion, um, but I, I had some very extensive long conversations with people in Sacramento and, the, and with a number of folks in the industry and I think it was the consensus if we, it, by adding something, for instance, one of the authors of the two bills we're looking at was saying, well, we'd like to expand it to video gaming and, you know, there's companies who've looked at that and that's runaway production of a different sort, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think if you open that one door, there's a lot of doors to open. I'd like to do them simultaneously. And so we'll pursue that on a parallel track. Um, we do have two uh, cards here, if Ali Brown would like to come forward. And then Phyllis uh, Koenig. Come on forward. Good morning. Yeah, just to the podium right there. You can speak from the podium. Thanks so much, and, and good morning. Good morning. Hi, my name is Allie Brown, and I work at a commercial production company called Pretty Bird. I'm here to speak in favor of Resolution 12002-S27 to a council that's already been an ally to our community. The changes that you passed to the city's entertainment production in 2009 has saved my company alone several thousand dollars a year. And knowing that the people and services we employ has value that's recognized by this council means so much. In the past year alone, we've seen agencies and clients push us to seek overseas filming. It's a battle that we fought successfully for years, but as of late, it's an argument that's harder for us to win. And looking back at my company's jobs over the past year alone, we've shot only about half of our projects in LA compared to previous years where the far majority was shot here. We continue to fight filming in LA even on recent jobs like the Fiat job with Jennifer Lopez that played again and again that was supposed to be set in New York. We fought hard to keep that here, although the so to keep our vendors and our crews employed. We won that battle, but others we've lost, or in some cases we've chosen to lose. For instance, we had a $2 million Jeep project that we actually chose to shoot in New Orleans because of the, ta the tax incentive. The savings from shooting there meant that we could shoot two additional days that we couldn't have produced in LA. And that was a huge factor in us winning the job. We were able to take the savings and apply them to the project to deliver more to our client, something which is critical for a small, newer company like ours that needs to compete with larger, more established ones. But it meant not only taking money out of LA, it meant taking jobs out of LA too. 
We employed about 65 locals each day for five days just in our crew alone. We want to keep commercial production here, but it's hard to justify when we can get great crews and equipment for less while shooting <coughs> elsewhere. Everyone's fighting for that competitive edge, as exemplified by the production centers that are popping up nationwide and getting more sophisticated crew and equipment by the minute. We have a vibrant freelance community here that relies on us for their jobs. They're freelancers who don't work in film or TV. They're unique to our community, and the vendors that rely on us, we need, it's hard to explain to them that we need to shoot elsewhere because of all the incentives that other states offer. Thank you very much. I very got well, close. Well said. Thank you. <laughs> Phyllis Koenig, if you'd like to come forward, and then uh, David Phelps. Good morning. Good morning. I, I am Phyllis Koenig. Um, I'm the owner of Uber Content, a commercial um, film and content company here in Hollywood. And I am here to speak in favor of the California Tax Initiative Resolution, also 12-0002-S27. <laughs> First, I'd like to thank the City Council and the Mayor for passing the changes to the City's entertainment production cap in 2009, which I saw firsthand put several thousand dollars in the hands of uh, each production company and contributed to the recent increase in the TV commercial filming as well. <clears throat> for me, it's about my personal experience in the industry as I've been involved in the community since 1981 and have seen more and more production companies leave Los Angeles and head anywhere to try to make a budget actually work and get the job itself, not just to be a part of the unbelievably competitive bidding process that Ali just spoke about, be it Europe, Eastern Europe, South America, Africa, Cape Town, Johannesburg, or simply just to find better breaks and incentives in another one of our own United States. I'd like to highlight who I am by letting you know that I have the distinction of owning one of the very few successful, highly established, female-owned businesses in the commercial production company. Thank you. I've had to fight other ab obstacles to overcome a disproportionate number of male company owners and along the way shaped an accomplished creative shop and have continued to grow tremendously each year since we opened the doors of Uber content 12 years ago, even in a hugely and difficult challenging economy. All of my colleagues can attest to this, but sadly, in the most irrelevant discussion today, to circle back around to tipping my hat to the changes of, in the city's entertainment production cap back in 2009, and the very reason I took the time out of my morning to come here is to say that that alone is not enough to keep most companies, including my own, motivated to go out on a limb during the bidding process and work hard not to default to the easiest route by just simply bidding outside of the state or the company, country just to survive. Am I done? You got to say your last, <laughs> last sentence. You don't have to okay. stop right there, but go ahead. If you can uh, wrap, each wrap and up. every one of our businesses, I'll just cut to the chase. Each and every one of our businesses, uh, business people, owners, from line management troops to the actual labor pool of all of our gifted craftsmen and women <clears throat> and our local vendors, restaurants, caterers, camera rental houses, crane companies, local security, retired police force officers, those companies. The list is enormous. They all have been affected by each lo loss, each bid and loss. I've seen people lose their homes and their livelihoods during the worst of times here in Los Angeles, and I've seen many people move out of state for lack of work opportunities. These are our friends, our families, our, co our colleagues. This measure couldn't have come at a more critical and historical Thank time. Thank you, Phyllis. Congratulations on your successes as well, and very well, well said. Thank, Thank you for coming so this morning. Thank you so much. I'm a big fan of yours. Thank you. Um, and David Phelps, wrap up our public comment on this side. Good morning, Councilman. Uh, David Phelps with the Association of Independent Commercial Producers. Uh, we've spoken many times about this matter, so uh, I will just uh, cut to the chase. Uh, there is a time sensitivity to the consideration of this resolution, Councilman. Um, as the legislation moves through the Assembly and the Senate, important conversations are taking place about the scope of the film credit, uh, the current one, and where it could be um, after this year's legislative session. And we asked the City of LA to take a stand uh, to support a segment of the industry that is solely being left out um, of this important economic development measure. Uh, we want to point to the success of the uh, LA City Council's actions last year on the entertainment production cap. One of the statistics that I would like to point out uh, resulting in great success was number one, the City of LA had a record amount of filming in 2011. Um, that was due partly to the passage of the cap, but what's important to point out are the number of businesses that have filed with the city 
since the time that this passed. In 2010-11, there were 4,780 entertainment firms registered with the city of LA. In just the following year, as of currently this year, the Office of Finance um, and reported to me that there are now 5,542 firms registered with the city. That's a growth of over 800 companies who are now registered to do business in the city of California. And we would like to think that a, a strong part in that had to do with the efforts that the city made to restructure the entertainment cap. That's growth not only in the activity, but also the number of businesses doing business in the city of LA. Unfortunately, the benefits that have, have benefited the city of LA specifically aren't necessarily transferring to benefiting the county. While production activity in the city of LA is up a significant amount, about 22%, production activity in the LA County is down 38%. So we need to seek in, uh, incentives that benefit the region, not only the state, but the region. And we feel that opportunities in the state legislature this year will provide that opportunity. So we ask that this committee consider this resolution. We are concerned about putting off consideration of such a resolution. Sure. And to do, and, all, and with all respect to all of the different industries that mm -hmm. would like to be a part of this initiative, I must say that uh, the commercial production industry has been an active uh, participant in uh, any discussions or talks on a film credit for many, many years, more than any other industry segment. And I think the focus of this issue is not every entertainment firm. It's who produces motion picture, who employs crews in our city. And that's why we believe that the commercial production industry should be a part of this measure um, Thank you. before Appreciate anybody it. else. Thank you. And I, I couldn't agree uh, more. Thank you for the testimony. Um, you have my word that while this is in session, we will, whether that takes us a week or two to turn it around, the parallel track to this, we will state very clearly where we're at, I think, with both the commercial, first and foremost, but al also other segments that we are losing um, and have lost. You're still here. Um, it's a critical piece. I want to thank the folks who have come here from the commercial production industry, uh, but it will be still while this session is underway. Um, but Councilman. A single person I spoke with uh, in Sacramento, um, I mean, they're hanging on by a thread for the existing $100 million, they said, and, and it may not even go this year. So I want to make sure we're doing both loud and clear. Um, but you have my word, it won't get lost in this session. Okay. Yes, Thank Mr. Wickham. Uh, just another, a couple quick notes. County of Los Angeles has taken a support position mm -hmm. um, for the California Film Tax Program extension. Okay. Um, governors, Duke Magian, uh, Wilson and Davis mm -hmm. just published yesterday an editorial in Sacramento B urging extension of and support of the film industry, um, which is important. The Assembly Revenue and Tax Committee will be taking up AB 2026 on Monday the 14th. Mm -hmm. So that's the next hearing for, for that bill. Um, and this item is, is scheduled in council this Friday. Okay. Um, so what we might be able to do is then by Friday even have on the resolution that we support uh, what's before us and the future. We can put it in, in general terms to make sure folks are armed up there in general terms of future expansion in specific areas as well. But let's, we want to be very loud and clear, I think, on, on what is uh, before them as well. The city of Los Angeles doesn't have conditional support, I guess is my main point, on it needing to expand before we'd support even the, the continuation of what we have. So I think that's important for us to have. So between even now and Friday, if, that's, if there's that Monday hearing, we'll, we'll work to, uh, on that language. So your instruction is for the CLA to work on that and yes. bring that in for Friday's Absolutely. consideration. So, okay. so if, for, if the CLA would move forward with support um, for the two existing uh, bills that are before the uh, 2026 in the Assembly and SB 1167 and work on language in the meantime for telegraphing you know, our, our support of that expansion. Obviously, we are on the record, I'll say it now, we would hope our legislators would do that this year. Um, but given that if they were given the choice of asking us if we aren't expanding anything, do you still support what we have before us? The answer has to be very loud and clear yes as well. Okay, all right, Mr. Parks, anything else? Okay, without objection. And, uh, and we'll ask you to report back on the commercial uh, piece here in the city as well and any of the legal impediments so we can see what, what further tools we have with our city uh, taxes to be able to encourage specifically commercial production as well. Okay. And so we'll have that in council on Friday. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate again everybody your testimony and your good work on this. We will turn to item number one now.
Item number one is a motion Garcetti Parks and CAO, CLA, Office of Finance, BTAC, and Blue Sky Consulting Group reports relative to the elimination of the gross receipts tax in order to create jobs in Los Angeles. Okay. Um, we do, I'm going to take my, the public comment cards at the outset, actually. Martha uh, Cox uh, Tickman would like to come forward. And then Jessica Duboff would follow. And then Yekig uh, Kashishian. 9.30 still. Good morning. Good morning, Harry. Nice to see you again. Good to see you. Um, I'm actually here representing not only BOMA, but the LA County Business Federation, representing Great. Tracy Rafter. She was unable to make it today. Um, I realize the narrow question before us today is the elimination of the gross receipts tax. But I think the larger question that we need to answer today is, do we want a, a, a vital and growing city? The gross receipts tax hinders business coming to LA, which lowers rents, keeps commercial property values down, and limits job growth. The city consultant indicated at the last hearing that the city might not be bringing in enough money to offset the reduction. My question is, are we willing to risk doing nothing? Now is the time the council needs to take a bold step to signal that we are business friendly in Los Angeles. The benefit of the gross receipts tax elimination is not just to recoup the tax funds, but to create an atmosphere in which all business can flourish. Again, we think this is highly important, and we appreciate that you've brought this forward. Great. Thank you. Thanks for wearing both hats, too. Appreciate it. Jessica, good morning. Good morning. My name is Jessica Duboff. I'm here on behalf of the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce. I've spoken before the committee a number of times on this issue, so I wanted to briefly, once again, thank BTAC for all their hard work and reiterate our strong support for the recommendation in front of the committee today for a step-by-step -step reduction and phase-out of the gross receipts tax over 15 years. While we support the complete elimination of the business gross receipts tax, we recognize that a phased-in approach will be required in order to balance the benefits of encouraging economic growth with the possible short-term reductions in revenue to operate the city. We appreciate the thoughtful simplification strategy BTAC has designed to reduce the tax while setting clear benchmarks to measure progress and success. We look forward to working with BTAC, the mayor, and the council on implementation to spur job creation and show Los Angeles is open to compete for business. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kashishian. Good morning. Good morning. Yeri Keshishan, representing Central City Association and our 450 members, which collectively employ over 350,000 individuals throughout the city. On behalf of our members, CC CCA would like to reiterate our past support of the proposed 15-year phase-out of the gross receipts tax. The city's current rates, with its convoluted tax structure and classification system, puts the city of Los Angeles at a disadvantage in attracting, retaining, and growing new jobs. The compromise before the committee this morning reflects a sensible approach to improving the business climate while balancing the need for fiscal responsibility. The built-in triggers will ensure that the city remains fiscally solvent and the phase reduction in the gross receipts tax and classification system will make the Los city of Los Angeles competitive with its neighboring cities. To continue with the status quo is neither practical nor economically sound. The City of Los Angeles is in a position to engage in meaningful tax reform to become a source of encouragement for business relocation and job creation. And the proposal which rests with this committee is a suitable start to ensuring downtown becomes the economic destination we have all worked so tirelessly to achieve. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the testimony. and. Also well articulated. We have, um, I think we're going to do a couple things. One, uh, last time we had, the Office of Finance didn't uh, get to speak at all last time, and we had some uh, a request of them on the growth of Class 9 accounts and some statistics. So I'd like to ask the Office of Finance to come forward um, for that first. We'll spend about 10 or 15 minutes on that. Then we'll ask BTAC to come forward and present some uh, response to the Blue Sky analysis for about 10 or 15 minutes after that. And then we'll... Uh, Leave the rest for discussion for our committee members. Good morning. Good morning, Ed Cabrera, Office of Finance, Assistant Director. So you got some good numbers for us? <laughs> yes, I know we it's have. Tough to, tough to find them, but I have full faith in you. So what'd you, what'd you find? Okay, well, uh, the uh, instructions uh, for finance, CAO and CLA, were to uh, take a look at the Fund Class 9 um, registration numbers and to look at the growth to determine uh, why these businesses uh, came in 
um, and, and as well as to report on the number. Uh, office of Finance, as we've stated previously, uh, uh, does not have the economic uh, expertise to determine why or why a business did not move into the city, mm -hmm. but we certainly can speak to uh, the raw numbers. Um, since 2003, 2004, running all the way through uh, fiscal year 10, 11, there has been uh, approximately 411,000 businesses um, that were uh, registered uh, with the Office of Finance overall. Mm -hmm. Of that amount, uh, sorry, so you, since you did two different, that was the baseline in, in 03, 04, or that's 10, 11. Uh, that's based on uh, 2003 04. Okay, the, so it started the, at 411. Okay. The growth from fiscal year 2003 2004 through 2010 2011. Oh, so, um, I'm sorry, so that's an increase of 411,000 businesses? Uh, that were registered, correct, over that time. Gotcha, okay. Now, of course, you have businesses that are that are registered and go out of business, but these, the, these would be new registrations gotcha. uh, overall. Of that total amount of approximately 411,000, uh, roughly 63% were routine registrations, uh, meaning that the taxpayers came in and registered on their own. Uh, they filed applications and so forth. 37% uh, were finance discovered. Uh, so approximately uh, a third of the registrations since 2003-2004 have been through finances discovery efforts. And we've spoken previously about the AB63 program as well as other discovery programs. So sorry, I, the, the, give me that percentage one more time. That was come from. Came uh, Sixty-three percent were routine registrations. Came out on their own. And, and thirty-seven percent were so balance, okay. uh, tax uh, finance discovered. Gotcha. Thank you. Drilling down to fund class uh, nine, uh, again for the same period, approximately two hundred and fifteen thousand businesses uh, have been registered and added to finances tax rolls. Fifty-eight percent were routine registration and 42% were finance discovered, again, through one of our uh, many uh, tax discovery programs. Uh, looking at it from a uh, overall revenue uh, impact, uh, again, and this goes back to the inception of Office of Finance uh, in uh, 2000. For fiscal year 2001, approximately, uh, of the 344 approximate uh, million in business tax that uh, uh, the city realized. 82% was from uh, routine taxpayer renewals and 18% uh, were from finance discovery, finance collection efforts, uh, finance efforts to uh, uh, collect after taxpayers didn't register and so forth. That number has uh, actually declined in terms of uh, taxpayers that routinely come in and pay their renewals. Uh, for the last fiscal year, 2010-11, 74% of taxpayers routinely paid their renewal, and 26% uh, was due to finances discovery efforts, collection efforts, uh, uh, renewal enforcement, and so forth. Okay. Let me ask you, on the 2010 and 11, what was the uh, uh, amount of business tax? Are you uh, for, figure 344 for 2001? For 2010-11, uh, 418,000.4 million uh, was realized by the city in business tax. Go, go, again. How much, go, go over that again. Uh, 418,000. Okay. I'm sorry, 418 okay. million. Okay. Yeah. And of that amount, we both thought that was a little short. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> I'm sorry. Trouble. Let's just eliminate it today, then. It's no big deal. Uh, of that amount, 312 million uh, was uh, uh, derived from taxpayers uh, routinely and timely filing their renewals. Uh, 105 million was due to finances uh, collection efforts. That was 2000. That was 2010-11. 10. Oh, and do you have that statistic for 2001? Uh, yes, for uh, t fiscal year 2001, or uh, 2000, 2001, 281.6 million was uh, as the result of uh, routine renewal activity in a timely manner, and 61.8 million uh, was as a result of finances discovery efforts. And again, since the inception of uh, the Office of Finance in 2000, um, our discovery efforts and programs have uh, been ramped up. Uh, we've added new programs, uh, starting again with AB 63 in 2002, 
And uh, just as an example, um, for the AB63 program, uh, since its inception, uh, the office has uh, uh, recovered $153 million uh, in business tax revenues solely from uh, that program. And we've also added approximately 157 location accounts uh, to the tax rolls uh, from the AB63 program. 157,000? I'm sorry? 157,000? 157,000, yes. correct. Location accounts. So from 2001 to 2010, thank you for the work on the discovery stuff. We've praised it many times, and it's been excellent. I'm going to take that aside, because part of the reason we wanted these numbers were to figure out what f didn't come from discovery, what came from the policy that this council adopted. Um, from 2001 to 2010, we have an increase of about 10 percent, about 30 million from routine, at the same time that we had a reduction of about 15 percent on what those folks would have paid, correct? That's correct. Through, through the uh, business tax uh, uh, incentives, the, the rate cuts, is that what you're referring to, sir? Yeah. Yes, that's correct. So without that, it might have been 12 percent or so uh, increase over that time period. Uh, theoretically. I, th I think uh, Rex can help us with these numbers uh, off the top of that. But uh, in other words, if we, if we increased by 10 percent, but we had a reduction of 15 percent, if we didn't have that reduction of 15 percent, you can add to that 15 percent of 10 percent. So I think we would be like 11.5 percent increase on the routine. We would, we would defer minutes. that analysis to CAO's Office of Economic, uh, economic I know, Analysis. <clears throat> I know it's always dangerous for a committee chair to start doing math on the fly. But I think, I think uh, relatively uh, um, good. So, um, so if we're trying to figure out what impact, and I don't know what the inflation rate over that time was. Do you have any idea, Rex, what, over the t 10 years? Relatively low, so maybe over those 10 years. 3% maybe cumulatively over that period? Okay. 3% a year. Well, do, you, do you mind coming to the table, Rex? Yeah, yeah, come on. Mr. Numbers. Um. So, yeah, for detailed work, I, I yes. really have to go back and, and part, part of, I guess, what we're trying to, to figure out is that impact of uh, what the Swenson study and other things depend on is, you know, what the growth has been based on what we did earlier. Uh, Mr. Parks has raised and others have raised, um, well, maybe that's all just from discovery. It looks like there's a combination of discovery and expansion of, of, uh, of the amount that we're collecting and certainly the number of, of businesses. Uh, during that period. When you said 411,000 new accounts, out of how many total? Well, that's over time. Uh, currently, we have approximately between 400 and, 430,000 uh, and 440,000 Okay, so accounts. wasn't an increase. So what was the increase over, you said 2003, 2004 to 2010, 2011. There was, uh, when I asked you if it was 411,000 new, you said new, new accounts, but it's not new, that's total accounts. Those, those are taxpayers that are registered, again, as I mentioned, so do you uh, know what the increase was in, in total amounts? Um, I would have to get that information. Okay. Because, again, you would have to recall that there are businesses that go out. So sure. we would have to account for businesses that, that are in existence and go out of business. You could have businesses that, you know, start new in, in a particular year. Uh, absolutely. But, but it should be an easy out. number to know. Yes. Total amount, total amount, right? Correct. Okay. If we could get that, that would be helpful as well. Let me, let me just ask one thing. On the 411 that you gave us, uh, or when you say new, those are not renewals. That's new. Those are new, correct. Those are new registrations, correct. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, well, I think that gives us some of the data. I think we'll have to, to crunch a, a piece of it. Um, but I think it looks like there's a combination of both uh, discovery work that's been done in the Office of Finance, which has been very good, and from some, it could be the growth in the economy naturally, it could be the policies we've, we've uh, enacted here. I think 
it would be difficult to imagine the policies since there's no study that we've commissioned from Swenson to Blue Sky to others that hasn't said there's some impact on the economy when you reduce those taxes. So I think it's safe to assume that some of that activity has been the direct result um, of, of some of the policies and the reduction of the business tax and the elimination for, for some small businesses as well. So um, I think that answers the questions I'd asked. Is there anything else you want from yeah. Office Finance? One thing I was just wondering, and I'm going to make an assumption, that the the routine registrations would include those that also fall under the uh, the tax breaks of what five hundred thousand or, or or less. That's correct. A actually, uh, businesses that may qualify for either the small business exemption or the new business exemption. Um, could be included under routine registrations or discovered. And also, now, what do we call it, holiday? A tax holiday. Yeah. That's the current okay. uh, term. Yeah. But if a business is discovered um, and they were previously uh, engaged in business in the city in a prior year, there are any benefits uh, for years that they were not registered would not be applicable. However, for example, we do discover a business uh, today um, that is a small business in a future year they may qualify. So your question is correct that yes, both um, small business, new business exemption uh, uh, accounts could fall under either routine registrations or in subsequent years uh, uh, finance discovered registrations. When you come back, could you give us a feel of how many of these businesses that you've identified either new or routine fell under those exemptions? Sure, we can certainly do that. Because that would give, give us some idea of the remaining number and what may be this uh, more of a significant increase in the tax base on a smaller number of businesses. Certainly, we can report back on that. Okay. okay. Great, and I'd like to work with CAO, CLA. I mean, I think the final formula we're trying to figure out here in the committee as we move this forward today, and we, you know, by the time it comes to council, I'd like to perhaps have some of this. Is the impact of the past city council policies is something, a formula somewhere like this: the increase in the non-discretionary, or no, sorry, non-discovery monies that were highlighted by the Office of Finance, taking into account tax holiday losses and any losses from the reduction in business tax. In other words, the revenues that would have come in from that, minus some sort of expected rise in inflation, would give us, I think, the net. Obviously, there's other factors in the economy. We can't know what those are, but at least it gives us something that we can assign a good deal of it probably coming from the, the impact of our city council tax reduction policies so that as we look at doing this for the business tax, and we're, not, uh, we're not as uninformed as we would be. So that, does that make sense, Rex, that kind of rough formula? And I, can, I can sit down with you and, and do that, but I'd love to, to work with you to see if we might be able to say it's – not safe to assume causation, but some correlation here that during this time, this was the amount of money that we got from the success of reducing our taxes in the past and that we could expect by doing similar policies in the future. Okay. I think that's going to be the, the core of our argument here to move forward. Okay. Yeah. Right and, and one other thing is that, uh, and I can't place my hand on it. Uh, let me see. Oh, uh, it's the April 18th report done by the CAO, uh, and the key is, is that uh, I'd just like to make sure that the $135 million that they talk about is that that's all inclusive of the tax breaks that we're talking about, or have they been additional dollars uh, in the sense of uh, uh, what the city has given as incentives, so we get a sense of uh, really what we've received back on, on this 15 percent and then the tax holiday and a variety of other things. So again, uh, I think that would fall in line with what Mr. Garcetti asked for uh, on the return. But I just want to make sure that report on April 18th is all inclusive. It's all inclusive. Of what we know today. Okay. 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 Council member will make sure that the amounts are included. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, let's thank you all very much. Let's move now to uh, testimony from BTAC. The uh, members of BTAC would like to come forward. And then we have a, a new letter, slash third opinion, or third take on the methodology of Professor Swenson. Good morning, gentlemen. 
Good morning. Good morning. We actually uh, Lloyd Greif, uh, Chairman BTEC. Michael Banner. We actually have three documents we'd like to uh, enter into the record this morning. So these are copies for each of the committee members. Let me. Uh, Also, do, does the, did the members of the committee bring copies of our report with them today? Uh, Councilmember Parks, Councilmember Garcetti, do you have copies of uh, BTEC's final report with you this morning? I, I do have the new, the new report, yes. That's correct. Councilmember Parks, do you have a copy of this report this, with you today? There's a, there's a new version Great, of it. Great, thank you. Yeah. Okay. It's April 18th. We'll just, we'll just be referring to it, that's all. What, which date is it? He's saying is it April 18th? April, 18th. April uh, 18th. Yeah. April 18th, yes. <clears throat> so the first document that I'd like to walk through uh, was issued this morning uh, by the Milken Institute. I believe you have a copy of their letter. As we testified at the last meeting of Jobs Committee, we requested the Milken Institute to review both the work done by Dr. Swenson and the work done by Blue Sky Consulting Group. And at that time, they um, came back to us with oral comments. Uh, we requested that they put those uh, comments in writing, and they were able to do that uh, in time for today's meeting. So I know you're just now receiving this, uh, and I apologize for not being able to submit it earlier, but in truth, it just got issued this morning. <clears throat> what you'll note as you uh, review the document, and I'll kind of guide you through it since it's only two pages, is that the gist of it is uh, they've looked at uh, the work done by Swenson since there was transparency to the work done by Dr. Swenson. Uh, they were not able to really uh, closely scrutinize the work done by Blue Sky because Blue Sky, unlike Swenson, uh, did not provide much support for their uh, conclusions. And in paragraph one on the key points, they say that uh, Swenson employed proper methodologies and they were appropriate uh, in terms of what he did. Paragraph two, utilization of multiple data sets, which was criticized uh, by Blue Sky, they say is conventional and the application of the methodology is sound. In other words, looking at both the NETS database and the late and the LA tax database was the appropriate thing for Dr. Swenson to have done and they refute the criticism of Blue Sky. In paragraph three, uh, they say that the benchmarking that uh, Dr. Swenson used with regards to tax code change stimulus on a typical regional economic system is also appropriate. Paragraph four, they say that his examination of the two previous uh, changes to the tax code here in the city of Los Angeles uh, was also reasonable and an acceptable methodology. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And then on the second page, they do say, <coughs> pardon me, I have a frog in my throat this morning, so I apologize for that. On the second page, they do say, uh, that they believe that uh, Dr. Swenson's use of utilization, use of uh, type two multipliers uh, and, and failure to take into effect the full time impact of these, of the economic benefit uh, is a, um, is one area of deficiency in what he did. And so the result of that is could slightly overstate the total economic impact. Thank you very much. Um, this will be helpful. Paragraph two. He also indicate that uh, because of him looking at both, and this again is the type two multiplier, looking at direct, indirect, and induced effects, and the difference between a type two multiplier and a type one multiplier is, is the induced effects. He says there is leakage, because you're looking at LA City versus surrounding uh, environments, and there would be leakage into some of your tax policy benefiting the surrounding communities as well. And in paragraph three, um, he talks about the fact that you really, he didn't really spend enough time, Swenson did not spend enough time looking at the time uh, aspect of when these economic impacts uh, would come to bear, uh, and meaning the economic impacts associated with driving other revenue gains from uh, the, reduced, the reduction in business tax. But in, in conclusion, in the last paragraph, 
they say that the positives of the methodological, methodolo methodolo methodological <laughs> approach, sorry about that, by Dr. Swenson, uh, given the data constraints that he had to operate under far outweigh any shortcomings. And they say that although the net positive impact of changes to the tax code are slightly overstated, most of this effect would be in the very near term. And the overall information provided by Swenson gives a largely accurate portrayal of the economic impacts of the elimination of the cities of Los Angeles' gross receipts business tax. So the Milken Institute has come out in support uh, overall in the work done by Dr. Swenson. We think that's important. Uh, the other two documents I've handed to you are a letter from the Asian Business Association. Uh, and we're entering this into the record. The Asian Business Association um, states that they strongly believe that, the, that uh, our recommendation to begin phasing out the city's burdensome and, and inequitable gross receipts business tax is a prudent, responsible way and will help, help attract, grow, and retain companies within the city of LA. Um, and then the Los Angeles Economic Development Corporation, which is also a highly regarded uh, economic research hub here in, uh, in the city and the county of Los Angeles, they too uh, come out in support of BTAC's recommendation. They say that they strongly believe that phasing out the city's burdensome and inequitable gross receipts business tax in a prudent, responsible way will help attract, grow, and retain businesses within the city and help reverse the wholly unsustainable and worrying trend of having added more than 823,000 people but losing more than 165,000 net jobs since 1980, and that's in the city. We also anticipate receiving letters of support from the, from the uh, African American Chamber of Commerce, which previously supported VTAC's recommendation, and the previous recommendation we made was more aggressive than our current recommendation, uh, and the Latino uh, Chamber of Commerce has also issued, indicated that they will be issuing a letter in support. Unfortunately, we don't have either one of those uh, available to hand to you this morning. We anticipate we'll have them within the next few days. Uh, what I'd like to do at this time is we didn't really have a chance to to rebut this document from uh, Blue Sky, which I think was a quote-unquote rebuttal of uh, our recommendation. And I don't know if you have a copy of it, but I think it was a very weak uh, analysis uh, by, by, by Blue Sky. And in fact, Blue Sky, in effect, more really supported what we had to say than they did uh, undermine what we had to say. If you go to slide six, they talk about class nine, which is we talk about initially reducing the tax burden for classes seven, eight, and nine, which account for roughly 59% uh, of the um, uh, tax payments. It's 42% of the taxpayers. It's the service businesses and the professions businesses here in the city of LA. It's the, it makes up 53% of the economy in, in uh, LA County. And it's clearly the most mobile uh, and uh, most likely to depart uh, part of the economy. They cite and they say, hey, it's diverse. And, and I would point out, yes, it is diverse. And there's some very important categories here. Category five is management, scientific, and technical consulting services. Category 10 within this class nine is uh, other uh, scientific and technical services. And category 15 is educational services. These are all, this is the intellectual capital that we want. These are the, these are the high quality jobs that we want in the city of LA, forgetting the professions and occupations, those other other, other high, pay, high paying jobs. This is the type of employment we want to see in this, in this city. Um, and these are the ones, when you talk about the scientific and you talk about the technical consulting, these are the ones out of which Silicon Valley is born, out of which Silicon Beach is born. And if we exorbitantly tax these fledgling businesses before they have a chance to get underway, guess what? They'll get underway, but they just won't get underway in the city of Los Angeles. And they'll take all of those high technology jobs away from this city. And the ideas and the dream of a Silicon Beach will be illusory. If you go further in the, uh, uh, this BTAC document, they, uh, they talk about, they actually agree that if you start off the way we start off, and this is slide seven in, uh, in uh, Blue Sky's document, they agree that if we target initially our tax relief at this segment, which is classes seven, eight, and nine, that actually will increase the benefit of the tax policy versus doing it overall initially, because they think these are the ones that are more likely to respond uh, uh, positively. And that's the uh, second bullet point on slide seven. So they actually say it would be a 10% greater impact, um, whether it's 10% greater or what have you. They do uh, agree that that is it is a, uh, an appropriate approach to take. 
if you go to uh, if you go to class if you go to slide nine here we think frankly that the uh, blue skies point is totally indefensible here they say that even very targeted relief likely will not pay for itself with increased economic activity and non-business tax revenues and I think that's frankly uh, now that we have the Milken Institute's voice added to the fray, uh, which supported what Swenson had to say, uh, that is uh, not a defensible position by Blue Sky. What we talk about in our report and what, we, and what we've recommended is a 15-year phase-in, not a five-year phase-in as we previously did. We've toned that back primarily because of the Blue Sky uh, report even though we have serious concerns, and we're not the only ones that have serious concerns, the Milken Institute does as well, uh, about the uh, veracity of the Blue Sky Report. But just saying, we recognize the political reality facing the city of Los Angeles currently. We recognize the economic reality and the fiscal issues currently facing the city. And that is why we said, phase it in, go gradually initially, and have triggers. And the triggers are important because the triggers mean that we are talking about a resp responsible and prudent approach. We are talking about being in a position where you can see whether this increased economic activity will drive these revenues that we discuss in our report and that we spell out on uh, where we talk about benchmarking. We list all of the various areas where you should look for increased uh, revenues to the city based on heightened economic activity. That's on page 30 of our report. And so I think um, I think Blue Sky's uh, position here is frankly overreaching and wrong. Not only wrong, but wrong-headed. They also talk about a trigger mechanism. We have a trigger me mechanism. It's discussed on page 30. Uh, they say that the trigger me mechanism that we've set, which is setting a benchmark base year and saying, look at the level of, of uh, revenues to the, grow to the general fund that directly correlate to levels of economic activity and say, okay, the year prior to when the tax reductions start kicking in, look at what that level is and then compare it uh, after the tax reductions factor in and say, are you negative or are you positive or are you, are you neutral? And if you're neutral or positive, you continue with the tax reductions. Those revenue items are shown on page 30. It's business taxes, sales taxes, property taxes, and yes, business taxes, because we're not talking about eliminating the gross receipts tax entirely for 15 years. It's not gone until at the end of this 15-year program, which means as you attract new businesses, you will have business taxes stemming from those new businesses during that time frame. But we'll also talk about sales taxes, property taxes, utility taxes, license permits and fees, transient occupancy taxes, documentary transfer taxes, parking user taxes, power revenue transfers, parking fines, residential development taxes, and other economic sensitive taxes. So we're, so we're saying look at all of that and that's what you're, and that's what you're geared by. Don't start talking about projections uh, tying some, you know, increased jobs coming from population growth because you have no basis to do that. There is no basis to make such a forecast. Uh, look at the last 30 years where you've had almost a million increase in population and lost almost 200,000 jobs. And then tell me how you're going to actually make an assumption that your uh, population increase will, will generate new job growth on its own. Um, so my final point is they agree, Blue Sky and their quote unquote rebuttal agrees with us. You go to slide 13. They say, uh, they actually quote the language from Bartek, which we cited, and which, by the way, was missing from their original report. They didn't all of a sudden put it into their report until they had to amend it based on us having called them on it. And that is that the analysis that they put forth understated the economic impact from anywhere from five to 15 times. Uh, so if you take it on an average of 10 times, that means 250 million of revenues, not 25 million of revenues, uh, would come from this increased economic activity if you eliminated the business tax. And frankly, based on what the Milken Institute says, they say, yes, uh, the Swenson report, uh, to some extent, slightly overstates, but I, I can tell you that they feel Swenson was much closer to the mark, far closer to the mark, than Blue Sky. We're not basing our recommendation on Swenson, and we're not basing our recommendation on Blue Sky, and we're not basing our recommendation on Milken. We're basing it on all of it. And we think that our recommendation effectively takes all of that into consideration 
and by stretching out the period of time that you're implementing uh, tax reform and tax simplification, because we're also talking about reducing the classifications and we're talking about reducing the number of rate categories, that this will make it easier for businesses to understand how they'll be taxed in the city and give them more assurance that they will be taxed not inordinately compared to other surrounding jurisdictions. And the point is we are in a competitive environment here where you can address the same market that Los Angeles City addresses because we're surrounded wherever we go in LA City by, by neighboring jurisdictions like Pasadena and, and what have you, uh, and El Segundo, et cetera. We know that it's very easy for, this, for these jobs to go elsewhere. And we right now have a very high unemployment rate that we need, an underemployment rate that we need to take effective action on. So one thing we didn't do last time, because we walked you through our presentation, by the way, on slide 15, and uh, you know, committee chair Garcetti, I think, said it very well. Their slide 15, they're trying to say, hey, you know, this is a central city versus you know, small suburbs. And the truth of the matter is, yes, LA is about 4 million in population, but the county of LA is 10 million in population. So it's 150% you know, greater than the city of LA by itself. And that is what we're competing with. We're not competing with any one city, we're competing with the county uh, for jobs. And you're looking at the transportation costs being the same, the uh, occupancy costs being very much the same, the labor costs very much the same. So what's different? What's different is that we have a business tax that is roughly 10 times the average for the other cities in the county. And that is not sustainable. And that is why we're losing employment in this city. So I would like to, what I would like to do is pause, see if my colleague, Mr. Banner, has anything he'd like to add. And then I'd like to open it up to questions from the committee. Because when we made our first presentation, that took up the, almost the entire time. And I don't think we were able to really uh, field any questions. And I would like to hear if you have, have any questions for BTAC, since we spent two and a half years studying this issue very carefully. Yeah, I would like to add something in as much as the decisions you're going to make now are going to have an impact on the city for decades to come, just like the proposals that were put together to create the business tax you're dealing with the outcomes of now. Uh, something that occurred to me last week was if you're going to grow employment in Los Angeles, we don't have corporate headquarters anymore, the likelihood of us getting, you know, Fortune 500 company here, you know, we'd all love to see that happen, but nobody's going to bet that way. The growth is going to come from entrepreneurs, small people, small our kids who come out of our, our, our world-class schools, how do you get them to stay here and create companies and grow? Uh, professional services, the, 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 the status of, of, of that category where we choose to tax the most is probably where you're going to have the, the most opportunity to, to grow companies and grow jobs. So you've got a policy right there that seems to me that is wrong-headed in as much as what you need to grow, you're killing it from day one. The other thing that's important to me in the work I do, and, and it's reflective of the, the input we're starting to get from the ethnic chambers, is that uh, professional services firms are easier to start because they have less capital requirements. The ability of minority entrepreneurs to get capital has always been challenging and will probably continue to be that for a while. So the city is a very diverse city. If we're going to get growth, it's probably going to come from ethnic communities where folks who have professional training are going to go out and create businesses and, and they're likely to hire the people that look like them. Statistics show that. So you also need to think about this tax policy in terms of, I think, a strategy around using the strengths of Los Angeles, such as its diversity, such as its world-class educational systems, and get your tax policy in a line to promote that and stimulate that. Uh, Office of Finance gave you great numbers about what they've done to enforce collection. And, you know, this $400 million number that's tied up here. How much do we spend collecting versus how much do we spend trying to stimulate and attract businesses? I don't know that I've ever seen a, a budget number that is large as what the Office of Finance spends to collect, spent on economic development and that's a, designed to attract business and make LA a place where we can actually be proud of people want to come and locate their companies. Thank you both. Um, and thank you for the extensive uh, two and a half years of work on this. You know, I, I think I've stated many times the best path, path forward here is not the one the city is on, and uh, one that's limited to cutting services, um, to cut costs, proposing tax increases to generate revenues. We must look to generate revenues through the growth of our economy. Um, we marked the 20th year uh, since the 
urban unrest in this city. And as you have stated, and as, as we know, in the last 20 years, we've added nearly 800,000 people, and we've lost 166,000 jobs. This is at the same time the county has added people and added jobs. There's something wrong in the city of LA specifically. It isn't only our taxes. We have challenges with our property prices, with you know, Fortune 500 companies may not come as much because of, our, of the difficulty as it is for their middle managers to find affordable places to live as it is for them to look at the gross receipts tax. Um, but there's agreement from all reports that eliminating our city's gross receipts tax would increase business activity and most importantly also create jobs. We can't just look at the fiscal impacts. We have to religiously look at them, zealously look at them because that's what we do here. We balance budgets. But we also have a responsibility to put people to work. We can find plenty of studies that undercut tax reform. You can find plenty of studies that support tax reform. But the reforms that we previously enacted and I think most folks have all agreed had an impact on our economy, a positive impact. And the specific experience I have with reforming taxes tells me that here in LA tax reform works and when we don't, it doesn't. I had a conversation this past week with the husband of a woman who was the human resources uh, manager in the West Valley at a manufacturing firm. Um, she hired uh, nearly a thousand employees about 10 years ago when the, you know, Folks who own that uh, factory said we can move literally, and a factory, as we know, has high impediments to moving. It costs a lot, but when they, when they costed it out, they said when we move out of Los Angeles, um, we will be able to cut our costs significantly because of the gross receipts tax. And they, uh, that woman had to tell a thousand people one at a time that they were being laid off. I just got an email from a healthcare uh, company, services company that's here in Los Angeles, and they're hanging by a thread. They employ hundreds of people here downtown, and they're waiting and watching, and they're at a point where they are very close to packing up and leaving LA. Studies don't capture that. We as policymakers do. Um, our ability to have brought new headquarters as well to the city often have been the direct result of being able to give them tax breaks. Um, it's kind of like parking tickets. I mean, we've read, read a lot about parking tickets. We can continue increasing our parking tickets so much that at a certain point people stop paying them. Um, but it seems to be that there is a, uh, a place in which we can do better. Um, LA's business tax, tax businesses, is even when they lose money, um, we know that we've been able to keep, and pay, uh, keep, keep jobs and sometimes attract jobs as we've made good decisions. So I hope that we will make good decisions as well. I appreciate the 15-year uh, phase-in that you have here. I don't think it's so much a political reality as that people have different opinions about the fiscal management and philosophies of what happens to our fiscal books. It's not um, that somebody has political favors or political pressure one way or the other. I think it's genuine, some genuine disagreements about how fiscal policy uh, works. And you have, I think, protected people from those deepest fears with uh, a very slow phase-in. I personally would rather see a 10-year phase-in, but I respect that you have a 15-year before us, and I'll continue to say that and fight for that. Uh, say that publicly, even five years, I think, would be uh, would make sense. But 10 years would still be fiscally prudent and could get us there. And I'll, I'll see as we move forward if I can't continue to be a voice for a faster one. And I appreciate that you've done work on a five and 10 year as well, so that if people want to uh, say that, that at, at worst they'll, they'll come in at a 15 year plan, we can at least get that done. But I think it's important for someone to say that pretty clearly. Uh, we want to focus, I think, on stage one of this 15 year plan, which isn't a 15-year plan, it's a five-year plan to collapse ta tax classes six to nine so that those classes would pay at a much more competitive rate. And to quote Larry Cosmon in the Business Journal, it would be a clear signal that LA's taxes are headed down and that it would be a place in which a lot of companies would start making decisions to stay and to come. It's my uh, recommendation to, well, we're going to open up to questions, but I wanted to say before that to move the plan forward as an action item to a joint committee, and I've spoken to uh, Mr. Kokorian to be able to schedule a joint jobs and budget and finance committee meeting. It seems the appropriate next step so that the budget committee can have some ownership and to chime in. Um, certainly, there's a plan that I support um, if I can't support one even more aggressively. Um, but in the meantime, we will work to schedule that. But I'd like to open up to any direct questions to BTAC from either one of the members uh, based on this as well. Can I second the motion? Sure. Thank you. Mr. Uh, uh, just a couple questions. One thing uh, I did read some few years ago, certain cities, like El Segundo in particular, has a lot of Fortune 500. Do we have a, a map of Southern California where the Fortune 500 do choose to reside? 
Did you do any of that study? Uh, no, but I can get that for you. Right, I happen to know well, that the right. city of LA has less Fortune 500 companies than Denver does. Right, I got that. Pretty sad statement. Well, El Segundo has more, I think. So that's even sadder. But no offense to El Segundo. I love El Segundo. <laughs> But I think the proximity to the airport and other conditions uh, made that possible. The other thing which is important when you spoke of, Richard, on the uh, issue of uh, ethnic communities, you look at the Korean immigrant, the first shop, Jefferson in Vermont, you know, 40 years ago. Uh, and then as the transition came up to Olympic Boulevard, and then the dominance now of uh, Wilshire Boulevard and what is greater uh, Koreatown, there's an interesting connection there and how does that make successful. The revitalization of the San Gabriel Valley by uh, the transition from people uh, who traditionally were in our Chinatown uh, moved to San Gabriel Valley for other reasons. And uh, it's interesting, it's a very important point, how we look at the towns are, are key to the success on this. And the other thing too was I think the most successful thing that the United States has done from a moving public to a different direction I think is the anti-smoking campaign. 55, 58 percent of the people smoked 40 years ago, now it's 13 percent. People were pounded and they got the right message. Now I flash forward to the Uncle Sam posters, I want you uh, to do something. The city of Los Angeles has to have an Uncle Sam poster. I want you to be a partner. I want the Department of Water Power to be known as a partner. Uh, and our rates, uh, which we're said to be, and we want to make sure that state stated our power rates and our water rates are much less than other municipalities, which is an important factor for industry and commerce. These are things, and I think and this is a big step, Mr. Garcetti, if we're able to get this through, and I thank you for your leadership and Mr. Parks, but at the same time, I think we have to say we want business here, because uh, there's a balance that's necessary. Some people do not want business for other reasons. It's a balance between neighborhood and commerce, so uh, I let it go at that, but I thank you both, gentlemen. Well, and I think there's another point, and it's a good point that you raise about Fortune 500 and where they're located. Think about, you know, when we talk about intellectual capital, Southern California is known as being the auto des automotive design center of the U.S. All of the major companies have auto de auto you know, automotive design headquarters here in, L in, in L.A. County or Southern California, but not in L.A. City. They're all in places like Santa Monica or Culver City or Torrance and what have you, but not L.A. City. Why is also, that? I think we've got to look too. There's a there's a time of life where things change, people move. I truly believe that FedEx and the fax machine changed Wilshire Boulevard. Before that, from a sociological standpoint, if you were in business and it said Wilshire Boulevard, that brought you a high amount of interest. But with fax, FedEx, and the internet, you could be anywhere. It's how we how Los Angeles can make sure everywhere is in our midst. So there's other challenges that we have to overcome. Well, Thank you. You're right. The internet, the advent of the internet in particular has made uh, businesses much more mobile. And the category that we're trying to address with this stage one approach is the services and the professions category, which is the most mobile. Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask the CAO and the CLA. We asked a while back when we discussed this subject to give us an outline of some of the impediments to businesses that were non-business tax related. Uh, are we close to producing that? Um, we reported on that in our November report, and I'm not aware of another study right now that would approach that. I, I just but I think we asked for that at one of our prior committee meetings where Oh, the discussion was uh, we went through as far as business tax and whether there were uh, other impediments that have been uh, put in place by legislation or by entitlements and things of that nature. And we asked the CAO, CLA, if they could uh, uh, kind of review our prior uh, business uh, legislation or what people consider as anti-business legislation and give us a uh, some kind of a collective view of that. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you for reminding me. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll pull my notes on that and we'll get back to you. And uh, to, yeah. to that, uh, there's, we're working with UCLA grad students and I think the Office of Finance right now is actually drafting what was going to be a survey of all of our LA businesses based on the Office of Finance uh, uh, database and we're going to try to go out and get all uh, uh, CEOs and, you know, 
business owners to, to answer that. And so if you have things that you want to make sure in there, I don't think it's any Brown Act violation it's to have you directly involved with UCLA students, so we'll make sure that you are part. Okay. Let me just say, on the, and having monitored this for the last several years, uh, the disconnect that I have uh, on this issue is that when we asked the CAO and also uh, I guess they got the information from Blue Sky, uh, when we go back and look at $135 million of previously enacted tax relief, uh, basically, uh, and I think where the disconnect in my judgment comes from, it certainly creates a lot of economic output. Over $645 million, it creates 5,200 jobs. But when you talk about revenue coming to the city that's non-business tax related, you're dealing with under $10 million. And so I think, uh, again, uh, to continue to look at reducing business tax uh, that we get in our hands, that is our tax, it's our dollars, represents 10% of our city budget to uh, create economic output is certainly great. Uh, certainly when we hear about jobs, I'm sensitive to that because if the uh, Chamber of Commerce report is accurate, uh, the 8th District has led in job creation the last six years, even though we've had an economic downturn in the city. But again, uh, when we look at the business tax versus uh, economic output, it does not seem to correlate to dollars in the coffers of the city, even though we talk about uh, uh, different kinds of taxes, whether it's property tax, sales tax, utility tax, the dilemma that I see is that many of those taxes are not within our purview to manage and we do not uh, basically get them directly or the full amount of them. Uh, and often what we find if those taxes come from other entities, they make a decision often as to when we get them, which can create at minimum a tax flow prop, uh, a uh, cash flow problem, uh, but at the maximum they could even at times uh, due to their economic decisions, eliminate them totally. And so these are things I'm concerned about, that we find a way to more clearly define economic output that is occurring in the city and how it uh, relates to real dollars that's coming to the city, not to the region, not to other cities, because uh, uh, in my judgment, if we're helping Culver City and Inglewood and El Segundo, that doesn't seem to be our goal as relates to getting rid of a business tax in the city so other cities and jurisdictions can prosper. But I think the major, dis as I mentioned, major disconnect for me is we cannot and have not seen how economic input turns into dollars of the same amount into the city of LA. And so that's, that's where I am on it. And, and it's, and it pretty, uh, again, if the reports that we get from our CAO and our CLA uh, are to be believed, uh, they certainly lay that out. And I think uh, I would uh, currently, unless something we have a new revelation in the future, I would certainly support the, uh, the, May, the March 23rd report that was uh, done by uh, uh, Mr. Santana that reflects that if you're going to make decisions about gross uh, business tax and decide to begin cutting those, that you should also be making decisions that basically um, impacts that direct revenue loss by either budget reductions or new revenue sources until the experience that uh, these projections can be made from real revenue. So that's what, where I stand on it. And I'm not asking a question. I'm just making comments. Well, with all, I do have a comment, uh, Council Member Parks, with all due respect. Uh, no, I'm not I asking for a comment. I just wanted to make my okay. comment. Okay. All right. Thank you for putting that on the record. We're actually right at the uh, at the hour, so we will we will leave it there. Um, go ahead, and we'll move that forward as an action item to a joint meeting for uh, jobs and business development and budget and finance meeting. Um, okay, let me. The, 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 you just got a new copy of the report. I'll explain why. There's there was uh, on page 24. There's a new statistic at the top that was corrected uh, based on information we received from Office of Finance after we issued our report. And I would direct Councilmember Parks' attention to page two. Uh, Councilmember Parks, if you could look at page two. Councilmember Parks, if you could look at page two. I please. already gave my book away. The report I just gave you. Well, you can see uh, Mr. Garcetti's. There's a watermark on that. What that shows is a job fair 
that shows a, a job fair line in South Central Los Angeles. That job fair line, uh, I think, spells it out very clearly what we're trying to do here, sir. We're trying to address this unemployment situation, and it needs addressing. Yeah, I, I agree, and I think my concern is, while it, addressing it, we don't want to cut services to communities that are in poverty also. We're not uh, in economic theory here, sir. We will leave it there without objection. We will forward that for our joint committee. Thank you to BTAC, and thank you to the folks who are a part of the hard work on this. I look forward to our budget and finance uh, joint committee meeting to continue our momentum. Thank you very much. This meeting is adjourned. Uh, just for the record, you're holding this item in committee uh, pending a joint uh, meeting with the... Yeah, with to move it for a joint, joint uh, consideration and a joint uh, committee hearing. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Sergeant, sergeants, please call the members.